everyone and welcome to a new Ireland now. I'm really excited that this um, this panel is happening, this discussion is happening. It's one that we've been trying to have for a while now, but um, uh, world events have gotten in our way. But nonetheless, we move and here we are. So um, without further ado, I am Emma Dabry and I'm a writer uh, broadcaster and academic. I am from Dublin City, but I live in, in the UK. I am joined tonight by... Okay, so first up we have Oluwatamilore Awanusi. I'm actually an Oluwa as well, um, so yes, but I still, I still stumbled. You know, I'm actually always getting like slagged for not pronouncing my Yoruba name properly, so I won't even like attempt to say it anyway. We'll move on. Um, but yeah, so you can, oh yeah, so you go by Tamalore. Uh, he's 20 years old and from Dublin, extremely passionate about social change and justice and wants to make the world a better place for every, for every individual. His writing has been published in the Irish Times and Fortnite magazine, as well as being an avid rugby player and under 19 cap for Connacht and ranking as number one winger in the USA's division one. I know nothing about rugby. Is it one AA or one double A? Yeah, it, was, it was division one double A. One double yeah. A. Okay. Um, he, so on, on, in addition to all of that, he enjoys baking and you can check out his berry cake on, ta oh my gosh, Tammy Laure Wunisi dot com. Okay. Yeah. Diana Bam Bamieke. Bamamike. Bamamike. Thank you. <laughs> Is a writer and emerging independent curator from Dublin 15, an alumnus of IMA after their writing credits sorry, IMA after, their writing credits include the visual artist news sheet, the IMA magazine and joint publications by the RHA and Temple Bar Gallery and Studios. Um, Diana's second curatorial project on belonging in collaboration with Basic Space Dublin will open at the library project in February, 2021. Next up, we have Erica Cody, who was born in Dublin. A promising career as an aspiring basketball player was thwarted by an injury at 18, but her other love of music, her other love was music, and so she went on instead to study vocals at BIMM and, and went on to a career as a musician. Her releases include the single Addicted and the EP Lioness. Earlier this month, Erica appeared on the late, was it this month now? I don't hardly know what year we're in. I don't even know what day of the week is. <laughs> it was uh, last month. Last okay, month. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, time has taken on like strange properties in, tw yeah. in 2020. Um, so yeah, very recently, Erica yeah. appeared on the Late Late Show with Irish Women in Harmony, performing their version of Dreams in aid of the charity Safe Ireland. Mm -hmm. Emma Davery, that's me. I've introduced myself. Next up, we have Rob Farhat. Is, did I pronounce that properly? Yeah, yeah like a hat that's far away. <laughs> <laughs> Simple. Uh, Rob is a former classical musician turned musical. Whoops, there's the baby. Is a former classical musician turned music programmer, manager, and artist mentor. He previously co founded and directed Ensemble Music in Ireland. He's worked with artists, artists such as Loa, Ensemble, Iru, Rusnago Family, and the late Connor Walsh. He is now primarily, primarily based in London. Sorry, one second. I'm trying to stay with quiet now. He is now primarily based in London and works for live music producers, Sirius, as their talent development and program manager working with boundary pushing musicians like Geica and Gazelle Twin. Um, he also programs the EFG London Jazz Festival. He was born and bred in Dublin and is a proud Irishman of Iranian and Armenian heritage. 
Thais Muniz is a Muniz, yeah. Muniz, thank you. Please, like, just pull me up if I'm not um, pronouncing. No, fine. Um, is a Brazilian artist and designer specializing in turbans and head wraps, focusing on their history and the connections between aesthetics. Sorry, between aesthetics, politics, and art. She is a curator of a movement and platform platform called Tur Turban Turbant Turbanti C. Turbanti, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Turbanti C, and meaning turban, meaning turban, head wrap yourself. Is that right? Yeah, it's um, turban yourself or head wrap yourself. It's okay. um, it's an invitation, a name invitation. <laughs> ah, say. That's so cool. Through Turbanti, Turbanti C, um, Thais follows the mystery and beauty of turbans and head wraps in the Afro-Atlantic diaspora. Its traditions and its new meanings, and she uses these as a tool and research object and has been doing this work since 2012. Traveling with Thais, the project has been empowering the Black community from all over the world with practices that include workshops, contact performances, audio visuals, and information exchange. Thais has been living in Dublin since 2014. And last but not least, of course, we have Aziz Saeed, who is a model and DJ and goes by the name Black Canvas. He's a first generation African Irishman. His blood comes from Nigeria, but he grew up in Dublin. In 2019, Aziz penned an open letter to the music group Versatile, highlighting how their privilege was allowing them to reach heights of success without, sorry, was it allowing them to reach heights of success, but had these degrading lyrics directed towards black women and this wasn't being questioned. Also, at the beginning of the year, he penned another open letter to the young black Jews and even OGs of Ireland with the aim of trying to curb physical altercations between his brothers. Aziz believes if you want to see change, you need to be an active citizen and try to plant seeds in the communities that you are connected to. It's part of why he tries to live by the saying, spread the kind of energy that will help the next person to grow. So thank you all of you for joining us. Um, just like looking at you all, I'm just thinking like how much I would have loved to be friends with you all when I was growing up in Ireland in like the 80s and 90s and I knew no black people <laughs> and had no black friends. <laughs> so it's very like, it's actually like very exciting to me that Ireland now has a small, but very like visible um, black um, population that are doing so many exciting things. Sorry, my living room is collapsing around me in, in my excitement. Um, so yeah, like on a, on, a, on a personal level as well, this is something that's, you know, like a really um, just amazing development. Um, so I can't wait to hear more from all of you. So, We'll kick it off with that question, you know, as I'm sure you've all been asked multiple times about where you're really from, but I'd like to know where you guys feel like you belong. So I might start with um, Diana. If I ask you about home, mm -hmm. where that is, where you feel like you belong, how would you respond to that? That's a great question. Um, I feel like home for me is two places. I don't think I'll ever just have one home. For me, I have one foot in Dublin, which is where I was raised, and where I went to school, it's where I made all my friends. It's you know where I put down roots. But I am also an Irish person of Nigerian heritage, so I feel like my home is in Nigeria as well. Um, I think when we consider the concept. Um, a lot of people think it has to be one place, and one place only, but I don't think that's the case. I think a person can have many homes, a person can feel like they belong in many places. And in my case, I feel very attached 
to Ireland. Uh, so I grew up. I love Dublin. I love living here. This is where my family are. This is where my friends are. This is where my life is. But at the same time, I also feel a kinship with people in Nigeria, with my extended family, with the people who knew my parents, my grand, my grandparents, my great grandparents. Um, growing up, so yeah, I, I feel like for me, home is very much two of those places, both Ireland and Nigeria. I really oh, oh. is that a dog? <laughs> anyway, um, I really, I really love what you were saying and that idea that, um, you know, you don't just have to have one home, you can have more than one home. I think the idea that we always have to reduce ourselves and just be these kind of like one dimensional kind of beings comes from this kind of scarcity mentality. You know, at mm. the moment, I'm really thinking a lot about abundance and all of the abundance that exists in the world. And it really goes against the kind of philosophy of abundance, this idea that you can just, you know, only have access to these very kind of limited and one-dimensional identities. So I love that. Um, Erica, I will come to you next. Same question. Yeah, so home for me has always been Ireland. I've been born and bred on the North, North City, Dublin. Um, so, but there was always that sense of, I wouldn't say a sense of loss, but obviously being half American and being brought up in Ireland, there's things that my dad taught, like used to tell me about his upbringing in the States compared to here and how different they were, but I could never understand up until now. If I'm being brutally honest, as I get older, I start to see it more and more and what it means, what he told me years and years ago. Um, But I remember the first time I went to the States, I felt, I felt at home. I felt like I found my tribe. I felt like I could be totally unapologetically myself um, because at home here, it was always, you're not white enough and you're not black enough. What are you? So I'm like, okay, well, what am I then if I'm not white enough for you and I'm not black enough for you? Like I see myself as a black mixed race woman. So I don't, if, for, for people to constantly label you in your home and constantly making you feel um, different kind of makes you feel like you don't belong anywhere. So when I went to the States, that's when I was like, oh, okay, something just clicked. And I was like, no, I, the way I feel at home when people say, oh, you're acting too American and you're acting this, that and the other. And it's like, well, I hate to break it to you, but I am half American and spend 50% of my time with my black American father. So I am going to pick up on, on, your, on a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, when I went to the States, I definitely felt like, okay, I know I can call this place home as well, because that's where I feel comfortably and unapologetically black do you know i love that what part of america is your dad from South carolina so we're, Ooh, we're down south yeah south i love the south yeah. I spent there, quite was, a few- there was still sorry there was still a lot of the um you know i'd get looked up and down because i was mixed race my mother was white you know it's still quite um it's still quite race like quite uh racist still down there so and this is a couple of years ago i would have been 15 16 and the first time I went since I was a kid. So I kind of got to see it for what it was properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting that you say that when you do, you know, stuff that you've picked up on culturally from the fact that you're American, that your dad's um, black American, then people kind of saying, oh, what are you doing that for? Like that really bothers me like about Ireland. Yeah. I remember my grandmother. So I was just like always being told how I wasn't Irish, you mm-hmm. know, how I wasn't really Irish. Like it didn't really like belong there. I remember my grandmother sending me some like um, material from Nigeria and I wore like a head wrap. And I remember walking down Grafton Street and this girl being like, oh my God, you have to put a piece of material on your head and try and pretend to be something you're not. And I was just like, what? Like, you know, there's no... It's like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. If you don't, you know, it's like you just can't win. You're just trying to be a person. You're just trying to coexist with people that, you know, might not want to break bread with you, but that's just what happens when you're put into to school and you're kind of used to a system nearly failing you, I suppose. The reason I didn't, I kind of lost faith in even reporting anything about any sort of racial hate was because I was just so used to things not being dealt with. And just being swept under the rug or given every excuse under the sun. Yeah, absolutely. Like ex- extremely relatable. Tamalore, yeah. <laughs> I'll come to you now. Same, same question. Uh, 
I mean, uh, for me, like, uh, I, I was like, I grew up and I lived in Rathmines, and then I moved out to Carlo, and then I went to boarding school in Kilkenny, and then moved to America and New Zealand, and you know, all those places for me, uh, the people I would have been with were predominantly white people, but I'd come back home and I'd be with my black friends, and you know we'd be unapologetically black and you know then at the week during the week I'm with my white friends and you know it's like a different kind of person as to when I'm with my black friends and I think for me the older I got I think the more I realize I feel at home where I'm comfortable where people respect my values what I believe in and what I talk about you know so I don't want to be in a place I'm not going to be in a place where people aren't going to listen to me or people aren't going to respect what I have to say or what I believe. You know, I'm a black man first and foremost, and you need to respect that. You need to understand that. You need to treat me with respect. So I think for me, finding a place where people were like that, that's where I felt at home. And you know, enough for me, moving around a lot and meeting a lot of new people, um, you do kind of you, you you gain faith in humanity because you do meet a lot of genuine people across uh, across the world and people who will respect you and I think for me that's where I kind of found home so yeah oh you're me you're still on me <laughs> yeah I, I was like trying to sort that out um yeah. when you like been traveling and people are asking you like where you're from and you say Ireland does that provoke surprise uh, um I no one has ever ever spoken to me and guess where I'm from like ever um, when I actually, the first time I moved to America, there was an Irish shop just off campus. And I went in with the English guys uh, just to get like, you know, they sell potatoes and club orange and like dairy milk. So, you know, we went in to get some and the lads were like, oh, Tam Laurie's Irish. They looked at me, he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I'm from Dublin. He goes, I've never seen the likes of you, you know? So you, you'll always, you'll always get that. Um, you know, I was accustomed to it, but, you know, some people just need to be taught things you know so I had to explain to him he had been to Ireland in years I'm like look there's there's a community of us there's a lot of us here and you know um but it never ceases to amaze me people just don't believe the first time I went to America and I handed over my passport um it was actually a black man in the customs and he looked and he goes they're black people in Ireland I was like yeah you know so you're always going to experience that I think internationally it's one of the countries people least expect us to be from yeah. you know like even with my accent, I can just say, yeah, I'm from Dominican Republic with a Dublin accent. And people are like, yeah, okay, grand. Like, do you know what I mean? But I say Dublin and they're real like, well, how yeah. does that work? Yeah. Anyway, Aziz. Um, home for me will be, it's Dublin. Honestly, like it took me some time to like, I guess, almost accept it because I felt that there are a lot of other people that wouldn't accept my Irishness, my Dubliness, but as I began to travel and like when I'm coming home, I always remember like home at the end of the day is, is Dublin. It's me going back to Tala, back to my mask gaff down there. You know what I mean? That's that's home. Like there's no denying, as I said, like, you know, the blood running through my veins is Nigerian, but I know Dublin a whole lot more than I know Nigeria. If I landed in Nigeria tomorrow, I wouldn't know where to go. Do you know what I mean? But if I landed in Dublin tomorrow, I know exactly where to go. So yeah, Dublin's home for me. You know what? Hearing your accents is like giving me life. Like I could just never, I just didn't know any black people that had Irish accents. Like it was just, I just felt like I was just like this anomaly, like in the world. And even when I'd go to America and feel like when I would go to Atlanta and feel like, oh, there's people that look like me. I don't stand out in that way. I'd open my mouth and people would be like, huh? And I'd be like, they're just like, sorry, black people don't talk like you. And I'd be like, yeah, you're right. They don't. There's like me. But that's not true anymore. You know, there is loads of black people that sound Irish. It's so it's so brilliant. And actually, Aziz, I was watching one of your videos and um, I was just <laughs> you were you were, you know, Irish people swear quite a lot, like more so than other people. Yes. So you were just talking like a normal guy from Dublin, you know, but so it was quite like there was quite a lot of profanity. And I was like, I love it because I swear like a lot of people are always shocked. I think they're not really used to hear, hearing black people. I'm not really used to hearing black people curse as much as I do. Um, so that made me feel very at home. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Even my girlfriend's not used to hearing me curse as much as I do. And she just comes from a different side of the world where there is a lot of black people there. But I guess cursing in general is just not as normal. It's very Irish, you know. Very, very Irish. <laughs> um, okay, 
uh, Thais, I will come to you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Now, um, Dublin became home for me, I'd say, since my second year here, when I, when I was in Brazil, like for two months on holidays, and I was just like, oh my God, can't wait to go home. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's just like, but I'm, I'm home. I'm like in my, in my country, in my city, in the weather I love, but also like this feeling of belonging to, you know, uh, like building your, your, your house and, and creating new um, relationships around the, the city that you are living makes me feel really at home. But also, you know, being Brazilian, you don't really know like where else could you belong. And also like, uh, I'm, I'm very, um, for example, I spent some time in London and I was like, okay, I could live here and feel like I could, you know, belong to this place. Uh, and then when I went to, to, to the continent, to Africa for the first time was in Sierra Leone. And, and I saw so many similarities that I was like, oh my God, maybe there's like Sierra Leonean um, blood in me. And, you know, it's just like this feeling of uh, being couching different spots, but um, definitely Salvador de Bahia, which is the city uh, that I, I was, um, I grew up and Dublin are like uh, two strong parts for me. Thank you so much. I went to Bahia, um, I was always fascinated with it because of the connection to like Yoruba culture. Yeah. And um, when I was there, like everybody was just like, what do you mean you can't speak Portuguese? And I was just like, <laughs> come on from Ireland. But like everyone was just speaking to me in Portuguese. Like I was like from there and I was like, no, I'm not. I, so yeah. I felt really like I have to learn Portuguese. I felt really inspired. But yeah. I have to. So, one day thank you oh and also it's Sierra Leone because a lot of Portuguese a lot of Brazilians were repatriated to to West Africa I know a lot actually went to Lagos and, and I believe some probably went to Sierra Leone and well. uh, a lot of us uh, yeah went to to Lagos and a lot of we went to Accra uh, okay. and in Ghana uh, but Sierra Leone was just like this first big first opportunity to be in the continent and just see like a lot of similarities yeah um, yeah it was really magical I know that like my family is my family's from Lagos whenever I say that to Nigerians they're like okay they're from somewhere else and they just moved to Lagos and you just don't know <laughs> and I'm like no they are from Lagos it's like an old Lagosian family like there's people that are from Lagos and that's my family but I know that in Lagos um there's like a that, like in old Lagos there's like a Brazilian quarter that's from that's like people that were had been enslaved in Brazil and then repatriated exactly. back there and some of the architecture is still there and some of the names are still there and stuff so I find that history so fascinating yeah and the same happens in in Ghana as well like there's a Stabon community that's like uh people who got repatri repatriated and just um kept a lot of the culture and habits so yeah it's really strong <laughs> yeah that, that those diasporic um interconnections and resonances are so like affirming and so beautiful yeah um, robert i'll come to you now yep uh so i mean i live in london but i definitely would see dublin as home um i was born and bred there uh i you know my parents are from Iran, uh, my, they're both from Iran. My dad's, my dad is Iranian, and my mother's Armenian. But I've, I've never been to Iran. I don't speak the language, and um, there wasn't really an Iranian community in in Dublin when I was growing up. So, so I wasn't really kind of, I wasn't really surrounded by the culture of my heritage, and I didn't really actually kind of, I didn't notice that there was something missing there actually until I moved to London, where, which is obviously much more multicultural city and having the kind of mixed heritage that we all have is much more common so it was only it was only once I moved here three years ago where I realized okay I actually I'm kind of missing something in terms of you know as like a part of me does belong actually somewhere else and I, I've, I've never been there you know I've been to Armenia once um which is where my mother's family is originally from but um but yeah no I mean so yeah moving to London it's you know I actually find you know what we were talking about there in terms of like you know having telling people 
we're Irish when you know we don't look typically Irish. You know, that I, I I find that questioned a lot less when in London when I tell someone I'm Irish. They I don't I don't get nearly as much. Oh, like really? You know, but where you read really, read from those kind of questions? I, I've got a lot more in Ireland than I do than I do over here. Um, that could be because of, I'm you know mostly you know surrounded by people in the arts, so it's not maybe super reflective of uh, of uh, what the rest of the, the country here is like. But uh, but yeah uh, yeah, it's, Dublin will always be home for me. But I think there is you know kind of a, a missing uh, you know foot in in another in another country that Saudi have never been to. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. So much of that is really interesting. Like one thing I want to pick up in particular is I find that remarkable that you have people here accepting your Irishness more than at home. Because for me, that's one of the it's English people can't accept that I'm Irish. They seem to yeah. really, really struggle with that, even in the arts. Um, mm. I've been in things where there's like a white Irish woman and they'll be like, oh, we have an Irish guest today. I'm like, you've got two Irish guests, but yeah. like they just can't like see my Irishness so that happens that happens I find here a lot that really they, they struggle to acknowledge it um but okay thank you so much um so next up sorry one second my questions have blocked okay we have lots of questions but because we have just <laughs> spent so much time on the first one I'm gonna have to jump through some of them because we're not going to get to cover Featuring my 11 month old baby, um, my apologies. Okay, so in Ireland, we talk a lot about how British people don't know about our history. Do you think Irish people know much about other people's histories? So with this one, I won't ask all of you. I'll just ask a couple of you and that's how I'll go with the next few questions just so we get everything covered. Is there anyone that feels a burning desire to answer that one? If not, I'll just choose someone. I think I relate a lot with this question because here um, I get asked where I'm from, from people from different backgrounds. And uh, when I say that I'm Brazilian, there's like this massive shock of like, as if there weren't like uh, black Brazilians in the world or like as if I was lying to don't say that I'm actually African or I don't know what the feeling that people has. Uh, and I relate a lot that like um, sometimes I feel that Irish people don't really know about the history the same way that Brazilians don't know uh, because we have a lot of, um, um, you know, traumas that we don't really talk about and sometimes it, this these traumas, they cover um, a big part of uh, what should be like brought up. Uh, so I think we've been learning a lot about talking ab uh, about our histories from the narratives of um, our own perspectives, not only from the narratives, because for me, I, I grew up uh, learning that um, Portuguese people discovered Brazil as if like nothing was there before. And, you know, after like many years listening to this and, and feeling like, uh, no, we are actually colonized. And, you know, that's like, that's something that I feel much stronger in Ireland, to be honest, like uh, this feeling of knowing uh, better how to name your colonizers than, uh, but in, in, in the nuances of uh, um, knowing more about history, there's a lot of things that I feel a lot of people doesn't know. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit more what you were saying about in Ireland, you feel there's a greater sense of knowing their colonizers. I'm quite fascinated by that. Yeah, um, in this sense that um, like a lot of the history in Ireland, uh, I feel when I'm, I'm told it's always like, Oh, uh, before uh, or after the um, East Rising, and all this, uh, the you know, the fighting against the British. And as I said, like in Brazil, we would name your the Portuguese as your ancestors, pretty much. Or you know, I have like uh, I I would I would listen a lot, hear a lot of people, uh, black people from Brazil. Uh, 
claiming more like Portuguese ancestry and a lot of white people thinking that they don't have any like um, African blood or indigenous blood uh, in a sense of uh, trying to claim um, kind of pride of this, um, yeah, this colonial past that is like so ugly, so yeah. Yeah, I think that makes me think of, do you know the, the cultural theorist Stuart Hall? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when he talks about like um, in the Caribbean, there's the African presence and then there's a European presence and the European presence is the one that is like the visible, the, the one that people obviously he's writing years ago and there have been changes since then. But the European presence is the one that is like signposted and advertised. The African presence is actually the the really the one that animates the culture and that yeah. is like one of the very like is very powerful, but it's like very it's suppressed and yeah. downplayed yeah totally totally it's totally like inferior i don't know if that a word in english but it's kind of put in an inferior box as if mm -hmm. like uh if you belong to that culture uh if you have this complexion or if you wear your hair like this uh you know you're like probably not a good person or this type of thing that has been changing thank god uh but uh yeah, it's, it's a lot to unfold and unlearn. Hair in Brazil is something I would love to have a conversation with you about at some, at some point, because the whole stuff around hair texture there is so, is, is so complex. And I remember I kind of got an insight into blackness in Brazil when I um, met, there was, at one stage in London, I was in this like very, I was out somewhere, there was like no, there was no black people around. There was like one guy who was probably racially similar to me, darker skinned maybe with slightly looser hair texture but essentially looked racially similar to me i said something to him about us being black and he was like no i'm brazilian and i was like "Ooh, okay yeah so yeah that was my this first is, kind of insight yeah there's this um there was a, a theory that was spread in brazil that is a uh, the myth of racial democracy where you know they're saying like oh we are all mixed we all have like uh, European, African, and indigenous blood. So we are all the same. But then when you come to like opportunities and you know the way that the game rolls is just completely different. So yeah, there's a big um, space and also a different terminology for uh, skin colors, uh, a definition that is called pardo, you know? So you don't have like black and white, you have black, white, and it's pardo be like, I'd say whiter than brown, <laughs> if we can name like that. Uh, so it's uh, it's really complex. It's really complex. And I'll, just very quickly as well, um, I would like to know how you feel kind of racial opportunities based on racialization, how that, so this is such a complex question. So maybe if, if you could just answer it, like if you could just allude to it in a couple of sentences but how different that is in Brazil versus Ireland or how, what parallels there are? Um, I would say there is um, this really strong sense that I feel that my work bring, builds these bridges as if, you know, in an aesthetic way, we would have touched like deeper points and it would allow everyone to play the game. Uh, but I think, uh, in Brazil, it's harder, you know, especially because it's a continent, uh, it's a country with like continental dimensions, and a lot of the 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 cultural spaces there is still being uh, run uh, by white people or people with like not a strong sense of uh, the importance of blackness uh, in that culture that's so strong. So the opportunities sometimes are um, really rare. So yeah, um, here in Ireland, I'm kind of touching these spaces now. So, and, and also feeling like after um, the events like uh, Black Lives Matter, a lot of this has been uh, brought up uh, to, to open up a bigger discussion about it, so. Sorry, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. 
Thank you so much. Picking up from that um, question, I'd like to ask the, ask the next question, which is, do you feel there are opportunities for people of different identities and heritages to tell their stories in Ireland? And I will, yeah, does anyone want to answer that? If not, I'll just pose it to one of you. And I'll probably get this answer from a few of you, actually. Aziz, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> Did you repeat the question again there? Sorry. You weren't listening. I put you on the hall. Right answer. <laughs> um, do you feel there are opportunities for people of different identities and her heritages to tell their stories in Ireland? Um, I think there is, but often you may not get that opportunity unless you reach certain levels of success. So whether that be, I don't know, if you're popular enough within your school group that, you know, you're going to be picked to speak out in front of a class or you've, you know, figured out how to maneuver the politics of the workplace that you are enough friends with enough people that they're going to be willing to hear what you have to say. Because I feel like when you're a minority, depending on the minority that you are, and if you know how to, I guess, what I like to call finesse the world, a lot of people will not hear what you have to say until you've reached certain levels of success. And then it's like, you have other people also to vouch for you that may be your white friend or whatever it may be and say that, yes, okay, let's listen to what X, Y, Z has to say. I feel like it's a lot harder if you're to some extent a nobody. And I don't mean that with any disrespect to anybody who maybe hasn't figured out how to finesse those rooms or like moving a room full of vultures but it can be a lot harder if you don't have the back end I think. What type of action do you think or steps can be taken to address that? Um, Sorry <laughs> it's quite difficult to answer. Um, I think Within the classroom, for example, I think it's important to, let's say a teacher's asking a question, it's important to maybe get different perspectives on that question, especially maybe if that's a question to do with like something to do with your background or your culture or food or whatever, maybe something that would allow different individuals to bring a different look on life to that. And the reason why I say that is because I think I'm very fortunate in the sense that my family is a Muslim family but I'm black and I grew up in Ireland and being exposed to all those different cultures allowed, I guess, my life to be more richer. And so within that, I was able to pay attention to the different aspects of life that like, oh, maybe I see something that's black and white, but I know that maybe somebody else sees it in a totally different way because they come from a different background. I think that, can be a way of doing it that really getting different perspectives as we like as anybody should you know if a HR company is trying to be more diverse you need to get as many different people in that room when you're trying to formulate a policy to ensure that everybody's actually being acknowledged within that policy because if it's just a black man maybe making that policy I may not be thinking of what a, a white lady may feel because of this policy or whatever it may be, or someone who's part of the LGBT community or whatever it may be. It's important that everybody's included so that the policy is as equal as possible, I think. Thank you so much. Tamil, Tamilore, do you have anything to add? Um, I suppose there, I mean, there could be, channels for people to speak up and you know for people of different cultures to speak it's just a matter of people are willing to listening to listen you know you can talk and you can be offered this platform uh, this platform to speak but if people aren't going to listen to you it's not of much benefit you know i mean uh, i mean, even with disease and i over a year ago we both spoke and you know a lot of people spoke on the whole situation of versatile and all of that and you know that had been going on for what three years people have been speaking up for three years and no one was listening so and then you know then something drastic happens and that's when people are willing to listen so i mean there are always going to be people from different cultures who are ready to speak and you know they will find ways to speak i mean you know whether it's for me writing through um my website it was disease um you know writing the letter to them you know we have we we, we, we find our own ways it's just a matter of people are willing to listen to us 
Thank you so much. Yeah, I, lo I love that. I love that idea as well. You know, that you're not always, you're not waiting for someone to hand you an opportunity to speak. You just, you speak and you make your voice, you make your voice heard. And I think I first became aware of you as these through those open letters. And I think maybe it was Erica sharing them. So there's like, you know, like networks that like just kind of link people link people together. So I think it's so important that like, if you have something to say, you just put it out there and there's no way, like in this day and age, there are so many different avenues where that can be seen and the potential for so many different types of people to see it. Like for me personally, I just started like writing on my blog and like putting that on Twitter. And that's how I started writing. Like I certainly wasn't getting any opportunities before then you know you start getting opportunities once you start making making a name for yourself but I think it's, it's so important that you just like harness you you put yourself out there and social media gives us that scope I mean social media is such a double-edged sword and I have so much to say about like the dangers of it um but I also do think it gives us that um people who've been traditionally, you know, marginalized from spaces, not known the right gatekeepers, not had the right networks, is given a scope to make our voices heard and be known, you know? So I think that's, um, it's, it's quite exciting time in, in, in that aspect. Um, I am gonna jump on to another question just because of time, but it's related to that. Um, I'm gonna ask Erica, um, are, what are the stories that you want to tell and who do you want to share them with? Wow, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I think it's so important for me personally to share, obviously I share a lot of my journey through my music, um, but moving forward, I find it's so important for future generations to know who they're, um, surrounded by I find it so important that like if I was to have kids that they know exactly where they come from and their history their family history that's something that I always kind of want to carry through um through the rest of my life especially at a time like this where you feel like um racism is never going to be a topic and um, people won't listen and then all of a sudden it's like boom it hits everyone like a kitchen sink and everyone has to has to listen you know there's no other choice because it's covered everywhere in um the media what's going on in the world so yeah it's one of those things it's it's just something i hold very close to my chest um that i feel comfortable enough to share now so my my family history and my struggles and what i go through if they can help the next person maybe learn or just to find out something new and to broaden their whole perspective on life, I'll happily do it because I'm a bit of an open book anyway. But I've listened to artists that I like who've, who I've seen write about things that they've gone through that have helped me because I'm like, okay, I'm not the only one. You know, so I think to keep spreading that message um, and to be honest, my biggest message that I want to spread now is that like it literally costs nothing to be kind and it costs nothing to be anti-racist, so. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, no, I, I keep talking and then being like, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's, that, that is so, that's so important. Um, yeah, this idea like of, of, of kindness, I think is, you know, it can become a bit of a buzzword or a bit, a bit yeah. of a hashtag, but I think it is something that's really important to try and like just in, infuse into, into ourselves. Yeah. And it takes a while. Like I've noticed it's some, it's one thing that just doesn't happen overnight. You know, we all, we've, we've all been in that boat of, you know, maybe gossip and he said, she said, but Girl. as you get older, it's like, you actually realize there's a lot more depth to people than just the surface and what we see. And a lot of that we see is on social media. So people feel nowadays they have to be so quick to judge someone's life from a glimpse of what they see online. Um, so I've, I've put it into practice myself and I just don't engage in those kind of toxic conversations because I know I've gone through stuff that I thought I'd never go through and it's just opened my heart and my eyes to the next person that I see that could be on a bus or walk past me on the street it's like everybody has their stuff so who am I to make it worse for that person if I have a comment on their outfit or how they look or how they dress or who they are as a person like that's none of my business 
Um, it literally, it, it, when I say it's free to be nice, it's literally free to be nice. You can crack a smile to someone and that can make that person's day. A hundred percent. And like with, with judgment as well, like I just feel like, yeah, I grew up in like such like a bitchy <laughs> backbiting culture. Yes. Like it was, Same. Pe- people often <laughs> ask me like how I cope with like, abuse that I would get online like from racists and all manner of things and I'm like because of how I grew up this is water off a duck's back like do you know what I mean yeah yeah exactly Um, but as I more more recently and as I get older I'm really really thinking about judgment and just being like who the fuck am I to judge to judge anybody and I often think like when you're judging people you're often also someone that is very judgmental of others is often maybe even on a subconscious level also very judgmental of themselves Mm -hmm. and it's also often like very like vicious to themselves it's actually quite like a a negative energy to have within your body you know 100 percent. and that's one thing now that you said that that's one thing that I've really come to terms with throughout this whole year is that the energy you put out is exactly what you get back so I noticed I was putting a lot of energy into things that I probably shouldn't have or I could have done it in a different way but at the same time it's like you have to say what you have to say you don't want to be silenced you have this freedom to speak but also I've just kind of learned how to to pick my battles nearly and if I'm going to put negativity out into the world it's going to come straight back at me so it's just like this whole it's a frequency basically and I'm like I don't really want to tune into that that the negative side of that frequency we need to to keep things positive and keep things rolling because there's a lot of there's enough negativity in the world for us all to chime in do you know what I mean yeah a hundred percent I I have to apologize for becoming like increasingly gothic as this conversation (laughs) goes on I'm just like dissolving into the gloom but I don't want to stand up to put the light on because (laughs) that would be disruptive so just bear with me as it becomes okay increasingly dark where I am um Diana the same question to you can yeah what stories do you want to put out there oh what stories um well I think in my curatorial practice something that I am starting to really hone in on is to tell stories that are edifying of and inclusive of the just vast spectrum of experience in contemporary Ireland. Um, I want to be able to include the experiences of black people, of other people of color, of people in the traveling community, people who live in direct provision. And I think in the position that I am in now, being able to, I don't know, exercise some of that agency, you know, by being a curator, by, you know, putting together exhibitions or writing texts that I feel are reflective of contemporary Ireland I think is a great way um, for me to be able to tell those stories and I think the points that yourself Emma and um, Erica made before um, of of just you know having that I suppose autonomy having you know the ability to tell those stories yourself and being able to stake out that ground because I think the unfortunate thing is I think as you said this before as well like just because you know the stories of those people exist and you know they're out there in public domain it doesn't mean that you know there's going to be willing or active listeners so I think being able to platform yourself and being able to put other people on as well if you reach any degree of success like I can't say <laughs> I can't say that I'm you know wildly successful myself but everything that I've done so far I want to make sure that I'm including people in my community that I'm including people who ordinarily don't have voices given to them who don't have a presence in the media or if they do have a presence in the media it's largely negative it's largely malicious and what with the very very worrying and concerning trend towards the far right in Ireland and across the globe in the past few years um, this is something that's become even more and more important and more vital in my practice and I think there's an urgency to what I'm doing now and I think there's an urgency I'm not sure if everybody else feels this but I think there's an urgency to everybody's work here right now being able to tell those stories and tell them in such a way that they are you know like I said edifying for people that they're genuinely inclusive of and accepting of other people's experiences and also I think it's really important not to narrow like Irish contemporary life down to like one lens. I think especially what we've seen in the past sort of 
10, 15 years or so is that Irishness isn't just like white middle class from the pale, from like, I don't know, Southside Dublin or whatever. Like it's so much more than that. It's so vibrant. Like even where I grew up in Blanchardstown, like I grew up, you know, going to the local library, going to Driocht, which is the art center in Blanche and seeing, you know, vast sort of lots of different types of people like engaging with the art there and engaging in their local community centers, even you know, the, the local radio station, I think, in Blanchard Center is Phoenix FM. And there's a, a radio show on there that's hosted by a Nigerian immigrant. And being able to have those stories in place across those different media has been really important to me as well. And that's something that I want to continue to, I don't know, perpetuate or, or continue to give life to or give voice to in my own practice. And I see myself kind of as a conduit for that. Like, I don't see myself as just one individual actor or, or person telling the story I see myself kind of as the composite of many stories and, and I feel like being able to 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 do what I'm doing now like whether it's with the exhibition whether it's the work that I do with Black Pride Ireland whether it's just my writing my my curation whatever I feel like all of that is a privilege because I'm getting to help tell stories that otherwise won't get told or if they do get told they don't get told very well so yeah I think I think that's something that's been really really important in my practice as of late with regards to storytelling. Thank you so much it's so necessary and so important what you're doing and I love that description of you know being like being like a, a conduit and like I I ground a lot of my I, I teach African studies and um, I ground like a lot of my own work within like kind of aspects of primarily Yoruba philosophy, but other African philosophical traditions, like more more widely. And just that idea, you know, of like your kind of like ancestors, like kind of being being more than just you, like basically like what you express is also like it's your community. It's the people who've come before you that you're like that you're descended from. Um, Oh, there's a thing that I'm thinking of. Oh yeah, when um, the, I don't know if you know the Imbira, the piano of, um, Z not, it's not a piano, sorry. It's um, a, an instrument in Zimbabwe. It's like their national instrument. It's like very, like a, a great cultural significance, but mm. it's used to like communicate. One of the functions, the primary function is to communicate with their ancestral spirits. But if you ask like an Imbira player, like how they, have they composed their song? they're like no these songs come to me I didn't write this this comes to me like in my dreams this comes to me like from my ancestors they're like conduits for this far greater kind of power and expression so it's just making me think about that so thank you and then um oh we're running out of time but I can squeeze in a couple more questions so um Rob I want to come to you for for this one um so in terms of I think all of you are pursuing um, or involved in successful in creative careers. Um, I want to ask Rob about his experience of the cultural establishment in Ireland and um, the barriers to entry for diverse voices. Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, I think first we got to acknowledge that, you know, uh, minority communities in Ireland are, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, being part of the kind of uh, wider population is, is a relatively new thing, and and the the so the arts establishment is quite is is hasn't quite caught up on uh, representing minority voices. Um, I uh, so uh, before I moved to London, I I spent most of my time working with uh, uh, minority uh, artists uh, in, in music, and what we found was that. Um, there's always kind of a, a higher bar for uh, for minority artists to get opportunities. Uh, there's always a higher bar and then also a lower ceiling. So you know when when you're looking at festival lineups, etc., and and trying to get opportunities for for my, uh, black or brown artists, um, you always are have you have to have kind of uh, as as a couple of people here mentioned earlier, you kind of have to have already proven yourself uh, uh, to a certain extent and you have to you know to, in order to do that you have to kind of make those those initial opportunities yourself so um so and then once you do prove yourself then then the arts establishment starts 
giving you some opportunities, but even those can have can tend to be quite tokenistic. So you might be given, you know, a, you know, a slot as part of a wire line up here, but you're not give, being given uh, an opportunity kind of to to represent yourself in in your fullest. So I I find that with, um, you know, with uh, be it venues or or festivals, when they think of like a, a an African uh, musician, what they you know they they kind of have a stereotype of an African artist in mind. Whereas an an Irish musician who is of African heritage, their their music and their their or their art is going to be complex because of their complex heritage. You know, it's they you know they have you know they'll be uh, you know creating uh, you know they'll be writing lyrics or creating art that's you know that demonstrates their kind of mixed heritage and what it means to be a black or brown person in in a country like Ireland and that kind of complexity is uh, I think audiences are 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 really willing to engage with that but the music industry or the arts establishment kind of want, likes to box artists off into kind of more easy to define corners so um so until literally the last few months uh I definitely found those kind of those kind of barriers quite hard to 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 break down and it's part of why I moved to London where things are different you know there's there's more of a kind of history of, of minority communities in, involved in the arts and there's more policy around uh, around inclus in, in, inclusivity around um, uh, I think minorities here um, if not without its flaws either but um, yeah so really I mean what I what I really advocate for always is that you know it's not it's not just for programmers of venues to just um, program a uh, black or brown artist here and there. You really need to hand over the platforms to curators who actually know, uh, you know, uh, who are from those communities and really know the, the, the culture, you know? Like the, the reality is that, you know, pretty much every festival or venue or, or program director in Ireland is is white. They're, they're mostly men and they're they're basically all white. And, and you know, it, it's not, Part of Ireland's education system, we you know we don't learn about minority culture or, or or art, you know. So it's okay to admit, okay, I actually don't know anything about uh, about this culture. And so, in, in you know, instead of trying to to still be that kind of like all powerful curator, you, you know, it's it's much more, uh, you know, it, it's totally fine to to admit that okay, this isn't my expert expertise. I need to actually hand over those platforms to the people. Uh, who, who who actually know about uh, the, the culture and who are from those communities and give younger people a chance, you know. Thank you so much. And yeah. do you think there's more? Um, what do what do you think we need to kind of round up? But Robert, Rob, Robert, um, and then anybody else who wants to make a suggestion as well. What do you, in in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests, everything that has happened in this year of that I don't even have the words for, do you think, do you feel that there is a change happening in Ireland in terms of like the cultural arts or do you feel it's more just tokenistic and performative or do you think that kind of like deep structural change can occur? And I'll start with Rob and then maybe one more sure. of you if you want to answer. I, I actually have been encouraged by the response from the from arts institutions the last few months. I mean, like this panel discussion taking place is an example of that, you know, that like where the festival has literally just given a platform to people of color involved in the arts to, to say their piece. Um, and there are other examples of it in terms of uh, venues and festivals um, uh, doing what I said, where, you know, actually giving the platform to a, a, a collective like Narrow Lane, uh, uh, Denise Chyla and, and God Knows' um, hip hop collective uh, performing the concert all year, year and night. So I think there is, while Ireland actually has a lot of catching up to do in terms of representing minorities, it's also because there has, there's basically been no policy to, to deal with, uh, to, uh, to address inclusivity. At least we can get things right from the start, you know? And I do think there's at least Compared to England, there is a greater, there's, there's, there's in Ireland, you know, in Ireland, there's a greater level of humility and empathy, I think, towards minorities compared to it, where in England, where the, the imbalances in, in power are, you know, and the systemic racism is, is entrenched in how, you know, it's, it's what the country is built on. So, so in England, the attempts to, to be more inclusive in the arts have, have been very tokenistic and have been 
really about kind of ticking boxes. And while there is policy in place, it's it doesn't really address the structural issues. It doesn't really engage with communities. You know, actually programming black and brown artists is actually the easier, the easy part. The the harder part is actually engaging, uh, genuine engaging with communities, bringing, you know, diversifying your staff. You know, those are those are the actual, those are the difficult, more medium to long term uh, issues that that need to be uh, that need to fix. Um, uh, you know, diversifying your programming is something that can be done quite quite quickly, and I do see it happening. But uh, you know, in fairness, the, the Arts Council in Ireland uh, since last year has had um, has been developing a, a, a quality and diversity policy, which which and I, I really do think that their the intentions there are really genuine, and uh, and um, yeah, you know, it's. I do think it's also it's more important to get it done, you know, to 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 address this issue right than to do it fast. You know, I think in England they've tried to, you know, in kind of from the new labor era in the 90s, they they tried to address structural racism in the arts and it is but it was very much a mechanical, you know, let's, you know, let's just um, you know, try and get, you know, put more black and brown artists into a structurally racist system, you know, rather than to actually address. The um, the systemic issues at, the, at its core, you know. Thank you. I think that's a really interest. It's a really interesting comparison between the UK and Ireland as well. Um, we've gone a little bit over time, so I'm actually going to round. I'm going to round up there. But thank you all so much for joining this conversation. You make me really, you make me feel really proud and like excited about the future, the future of Ireland. Um, so yeah, just uh, thank you, thank you. Does anyone? Yeah, <laughs> I'm a big fan of all of you. So. Well, it's been great to finally sit down and chat with you, especially Emma. I think it's been a long time coming. <laughs> I know, and we'll have to do it like in real life as soon as I can. Please. As soon as I can travel, I feel yeah. like trapped in the UK at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll be home soon enough. Have a lovely evening, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks so much.